Hey, everybody, listen, man. This teaching is a teaching I think everybody needs to handle the ups and downs of life. There's a revelation that you need to handle the vicissitudes of life, and that is a revelation of the favor of God. I want you to tap into this message. I hope it blesses you. I'm going to ask you to do one thing. It's the only thing I ever ask you to do. If it blesses you, text it, email it, just send it to somebody else. You never know who needs to hear this message. Enjoy the word. Amen. Genesis chapter 39, verse 1, everybody. It says this. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian, who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him from the Ishmaelite, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. And when his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. I want to stop the reading of scripture right there, and I want to talk from this subject in our time together, family. This is not for me. Somebody say, it's not for me. Uh, family, <laughs> family, I feel safe in saying that if you have spent any significant time in the context of Christian community, then you, sir, you, ma'am, are bilingual. You speak at least two languages. And for those of you who may be wondering, pondering, Pastor, what do you mean? I only speak English. Not if you've spent any significant time in Christian community. Because if you have, you not only speak English, you also speak a language called Christianese. There's some sayings, some phrases, some statements, some responses, some reactions that only make sense if you've been in Christian community. And one of these statements that is frequently floated from the lips of those who speak Christianese is a statement that's given in response to a question, how are you doing? When, <laughs> when we receive that request, those of us who speak Christianese from time to time respond by saying, I'm blessed and highly favored. Now, to people who don't have a revelation about this declaration, it sounds like some Christian colloquialism. It sounds like some religious rhetoric. But for those of us who have a revelation of what this means, we are simply expressing the fact that we know that we are benefactors and beneficiaries of the unearned grace of God. Come on, am I making sense? This statement is not a statement of arrogance. It's a statement of awareness. It is us reminding ourselves, favors on me. Did you hear what I just said? And this is a confidence that I think is rooted in the reality of Scripture. Because all throughout Scripture, no matter Old Testament, New Testament, no matter male, female, regardless of the socioeconomic status, regardless of the age and era that they lived in, you'll see this common thread interwoven throughout the fabric of all of Scripture when it comes to God's people. And they lived with, were blessed with, they prospered because of something called favor. Yeah, we can't even open the first book of the Bible, the book of beginnings, a book called Genesis, without being exposed to this. We see it in Genesis uh, uh, 6, verse number 8. The Bible says that Noah, that man who had prophetic insight to build the ark, the man who believed it was going to rain before there was a cloud in the sky, the man who took a prophetic word and did more than praise, he prepared. <laughs> yeah, did you hear what I just said? Because your preparation is an indication regarding whether or not you believe God's getting ready to blow you up. 
up. It's one thing for you to say, God's getting ready to bless me. But your preparation is an indication that you believe he's getting ready to make it rain. Because if you believe he's getting ready to make it rain, you build an ark. And people may call you weird. People may call you arrogant. People may call you presumptive. But when it start raining, they're going to call you blessed. I don't know who this is for. Don't worry about what they're calling you now. When God gets through, they're going to have to change what they're labeling you. This man, Genesis 6, 8 says, but Noah found what? Come on, this is 1230. He found what? He found favor in the eyes of God. Well, pastor, you can't make a general statement for all people based off something that happened with one person. That's exegetically irresponsible. How dare you take something that happened with Noah and say it can happen with all of us? I'm not done. Because if I move throughout the Old Testament, I run into one of the most overlooked, underestimated, underrated sisters in all the scripture. Her name was Esther. An entire book of the Bible is dedicated to her ministry. And how God used her to preserve and to save Israel from annihilation. And people don't want to give her credit. People don't want to give her her just due. People don't want to give her her shine. But Esther is single-handedly responsible for overriding and overturning a plot and a plan by Haman to annihilate the Jews. She was a smart sister. She was a strong sister. She was a savvy sister. I don't know if y'all can handle this. She was a fine sister too. Because the text says, now the king was attracted to Esther. Y'all not ready? See, away with this idea that you got to be unattractive to be anointed. I need a sister to find another sister to say I'm fine and I got favor. How about that? I got both of them. God bless me with both of them. Pastor, that's vanity. No, it's value. That's the problem. You don't value yourself. And so whenever you run into anybody else that values themselves, you call them vain when you're really insecure. Now, the king was more attracted to Esther more than any of the other women, and she won his favor. Noah's not the only one. Esther's not the only one. There was an individual in the Old Testament who was a king maker. Woof. See, everybody's trying to be a kitten. But God's called some of you to be a king maker. <laughs> Come on here. That, 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 those are people that are secure in their self. Come on. They are content in their own calling. And they feel a sign to push other people forward. Y'all not talking to me. Yeah. They don't think less of themselves because they're less popular. They don't think less of themselves because they're less prominent. They know that I got a king making anointing on me and that kings don't operate in their kingship without me. And everybody doesn't have to know what I do, know who I am. You don't have to call my name. But when I look at the king, I can say to me and God, thank you for letting me be a part of that. I did that. Kingmaker. Everybody wants to be the king. And God's called some people to be king makers. 
I partner with you. I come alongside you. I bring to you what you don't have to optimize what God's given you. And I've got the emotional intelligence and the spiritual, the spiritual contentment not to think less of me when I'm making more of you. Y'all not ready for this. Because scripturally, king makers were greater in spiritual stature than the kings themselves. Y'all not ready? Samuel was set, was solid. Saul was a mess. Y'all not talking to me. Samuel was solid. David was a mess. But this kingmaker named Samuel, the Bible says he continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people. Wait a minute. He did it for Noah, did it for Esther, did it for Samuel. I'm not done. There's another dude named Daniel. who is famous for surviving a lion's den. His activity is an indication that if God doesn't keep you from it, he'll preserve you in it. He didn't keep Daniel from going in the lion's den. But he kept him while he was in the lion's den. And I want to know, is there anybody objective enough and honest enough to look back over your life and say, is some stuff God did not keep me from? Trouble was in my way. I had to cry sometime. Trouble in my way. I had to cry sometime. Maybe that's for the 1030. I lay awake at night. But that's all right. Because Jesus, he will fix it. After a while, when he doesn't keep me from it, he preserves me in it. And is there anybody in here that can testify? I don't look like what I'm going through, not what I've been through. You don't know the stress I'm under. You don't know the pressure I'm under. You don't know the uncertainty I'm facing. And if I were going through this three years ago, you wouldn't be able to recognize me. But somehow I realize now unto him that is able to keep me. You looking at a kept man. You looking at a kept woman. This Daniel text says, I don't know if y'all are ready for this 1230. Now, God had caused the official to show favor. Y'all missed it already. <laughs> they missed the keys. Now, God had caused. They missed it. Corey, God had caused the official to show favor, which means that the official wouldn't have been apt to show favor without God's influence. It means God made him do what he normally wouldn't do because he was trying to get something through to Daniel. I want to talk to some people that have been overly glorifying your haters. You've been giving other people too much credit when it comes to stopping and blocking you from what God wants to do in your life. God knows how to cause people that would behave one way to behave another way to get you to what he has for you. He caused the officials to show favor. He did it for Noah. He did it for Esther. He did it for Samuel. He did it for Daniel. And in Luke 2.52, 
we see somebody else he did it for. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with man. All throughout the scriptures, we see the presence of this spiritual asset called favor. And why does God seem to be consistently and regularly conveying the presence of this asset to all of us? It's because he wants us to know that if I put it on Noah, and if I put it on Esther, if I put it on Samuel, if I put it on Daniel, and if I put it on Jesus, I'm going to put it on you. I need somebody that receives that already to say it's on me. That's why I'm in my right mind. It's on me. That's why I am where I am. It's on me. That's why I'm going where I'm going. It's on me. What's on me? Favor. What is it, pastor? It is unearned, uncommon, unexplainable, preferential treatment. It is unearned, uncommon, unexplainable, preferential treatment. It is unearned, uncommon, unexplainable, preferential treatment. When you wake up in the morning, look at yourself in the mirror. And before you start your day, say, I got unearned, uncommon, unexplainable, preferential treatment. Before you go in the business meeting, before you step out of the car, say, I got unearned, uncommon, unexplainable preferential treatment before you go in the hospital say I got unearned uncommon unexplainable preferential treatment and if he's giving me uncommon favor I'm gonna give him uncommon praise excuse me for 33 seconds and let me praise him for favor Pastor, Pastor Darius, Pastor Darius, if I have this, then why are you telling me I have this? If I have this, won't I automatically experience it? Why do you have to do a whole sermon on this if I have this? I mean, it... If, if I have it, why are you talking about it? I mean, I got it. Why do we need to do a teaching on it? It's because, are y'all ready for this? Just because you have access to it doesn't mean you're experiencing it. Pastor, prove that to me. Okay. The Bible says in Ephesians, we are saved by grace. What is grace? unmerited favor we're saved by grace through faith not of works lest any man should boast so meaning God takes the gift of salvation and he gives that gift to the whole world is that true but everybody doesn't access it because the text says it's only access by those who believe it exists. So I have to have faith to access the grace that's been made available to me. I can't even be, come on now, salvation is a gift of grace, but I can't even access it if I don't have faith. So I need to have awareness of this so I can release faith for this so I can access what has been spiritually deposited into my spiritual bank account. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is some of the stuff that we cover in, uh, the, the, uh, in Foundations 101 when we explain salvation. Most people think salvation is a ticket to heaven. And they don't even realize it's a benefit package. And if the only thing you get is heaven, you live your whole life only accessing one part of your benefit package. 
He didn't just pay for my ticket to heaven. He paid for my peace. That's a part of my benefit package. He paid for my joy. That's a part of my benefit package. He paid for my freedom. I don't have to be bound to anything that was created because of my creator. That's a part of my benefit package. But if I don't know it exists, I won't believe for it. So we can have the same God, practice the same religion, and have two different experiences. Because you get what you believe for. Y'all aren't talking to me. If the only thing you believe for is heaven, then that's all you get. But if you believe, he'll do exceedingly and abundantly above all you ask or think. If you believe that he'll open doors that no man can shut and close doors that no man can open. If you believe that he'll make the devil pay you back seven times what he took for you if you believe that your enemies will come at you one way but flee seven ways if you believe no weapon formed against you shall prosper so when people say things like this Christian thing not working for me it's working for me it's working just right for me I love it I'm blessed and highly favored I got more peace than I ever had. I got more contentment than I ever had. So I'm teaching this. Did y'all hear what I just said? I'm teaching this. See, we're getting ready to go in. I'm teaching this because we need awareness of this. You can't believe for what you're not aware of. And this revelation changes the way you handle the vicissitudes of life. It changes the way you handle adversity. Did you hear what I just said? When you know you're favored, when the, when the door is open for you, you say, this is the favor of God. And then when the door closed for you, you say, this is the favor of God. And some people are tripping out and they're spazzing out because they believe the favor's in the door. And they don't believe the favor's on them. So if it opened, that's the favor of God. If it closed, that's the favor of God. It changes the way you look at the vicissitudes of life. We're getting ready to go into this building project with the cab. I've never ran into one that hadn't had some sort of delay. Never. This is my fourth one. Fourth building, I've never run. But here's always our confession. Every delay is working in my favor. I feel that thing right there. I said every delay is working in my favor. Every setback is a setup for what God's getting ready to do. It changes the way you respond to adversity. Why? I have unearned. I don't earn it. So I don't feel like I lost favor when I lost my way. Y'all not ready for that? That shook your theological tree, didn't it? Yes. Yep. Because yep. some of because if you think it's tied to your behavior, then you cancel out the unearned. Come on, if you think you lose it when you lost your way, then you're missing the unearned part. It's unearned. That's what makes it unexplainable. Because people are like, how are you here? You're like, I don't know. They're like, you shouldn't be here. You're like, you're right. But I am, and watch me walk in it. I am, watch me enjoy it. I am, watch me receive everything God's got for me. It changes the way you respond to adversity. I'm wrapping up. And a powerful picture of this is seen in the life of a gentleman named Joseph. 
We're introduced to him in Genesis chapter 37. He's a man, the Bible, a young man. We're introduced to him at 17. He's a young man who has favor early on in his age. He's got favor from his father and his brothers. He had brothers who saw this favor from his father, but who didn't like this favor from his father. And the Bible says his father messed around, Genesis 7, 37, 3, and made him a coat, a robe of many colors. And this took the brothers to another level. Because some people can't handle when favor become visible. They don't mind you coming to church and saying blessed and highly favored. But when they able to lay eyes on the favor that's manifested in your life, sometimes it evokes insecurity out of them. So when I was doing all this talking about what God was going to do, you didn't have no problem. Now that I'm actually walking in what God said he was going to do, now you're surprised. So that let me know you didn't even believe me when we were talking about it. You were nodding your head but doubting me the whole time. He puts on this coat and his brothers say, you know what? We're going to kill him. So they get him away from home. They take the coat off of him. That's their problem. They thought the results of favor was favor. <laughs> All this coat is, is evidence of misfavor. favor. So you can take the coat, but you can't take the thing that got me the coat. You can take the job, but you can't take the thing that got me the job. You can take the man, but you can't take the thing that got me. Favor is on me. Yeah. They take his coat, kill an animal, dip the coat in blood. Because they're going to go back to the father and say some wild beast devoured Joseph when the truth of the matter is they had plans to kill him but one of the brothers named Judah said no I see a little pit let's put him in that pit and when they put him in that pit the Bible says as they're contemplating killing him there's a, a caravan of Ishmaelites everybody say Ishmaelites. Ishmaelites come on say it again say Ishmaelites, Ishmaelites. Now, now watch this so coincidentally let me show how favor works because he's in the pit, he probably don't feel like he got favor. He's probably feeling like I lost my favor because the pit represents a low place. But I need to let you know that favor will go. You need to know favor will go low. That even when I'm in a low place, favor knows how to descend with me and rest on me. Favor on me when I'm crying. Favor on me when I'm sad. Favors on me when I'm confused. Favors on me when I'm heartbroken. Favors on me when I'm in a low place. Because the Bible says, coincidentally, the exact time that he's in the pit, this caravan of Ishmaelites just happened to be passing by. This is about to shake your theological tree. Y'all ready? I said, you ready? Don't hold your amens. I only got six minutes. Are you ready? The Ishmaelites are descendants of Ishmael. Ishmael was the child Abraham had with Hagar. Ishmael represents Abraham's mistake. But I'm going to show you how favor will reach in your past. Y'all not ready? Because if there were no Ishmael, there would be no Ishmaelites. If there were no Ishmaelites, they would not have been coming in a caravan when Joseph was in that pit. Because favor 
will make the mistakes of your past become transportation to your future. God said the devil thought he was going to use your mistake to destroy you. He thought he was going to use your mistake to detour you. But I'm going to use your mistake to transport you. I'm going to let your mistake carry you. Is there anybody here that's honest enough to say I wouldn't be where I am right now if it were not for some of the mistakes I made? I got five minutes. Can I go further? I want to show you the providence of God, even in the frailty of man. I'm not saying God caused the mistake. I'm not saying God endorsed the mistake. I'm saying God used it. He even used the timing of it. They missed it. He used because if Ishmael wasn't born in the time he was born, then the Ishmaelites wouldn't exist. So God says, I know you're going to make some dumb decisions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to strategically time your dumb decisions when you're in a season of life where it won't destroy your destiny. He said, I'm going to let you get all the dumb stuff out before I bring you my best stuff. I'm going to put my best blessing on reserve, let you get your dumb season out your system, and then I'm going to send you what I got in store for you. And I want to tell somebody that's watching this or that's in this room, you hadn't seen anything yet. God held all your best stuff until you got yourself together. Now that you are wiser and stronger, he's getting ready to do what your eyes hadn't seen and your ears hadn't heard and your heart hadn't conceived. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for letting me get my dumb season out. Thank you, Jesus, for keeping me in my silly season. Thank you, Jesus, for not destroying me when I lost my mind. But I got two words for you now. I'm ready. I'm ready now. I'm ready for the next level. I'm ready for overflow. I'm ready for favor. And when you do it this time, I know how to handle it. When you do it this time, I know how to keep it. I'm ready. I got two minutes, that's it. put this man, I'm done, I'm sorry, I grew up Baptist, it's in me. They carry this man to Egypt. He starts working for a man named Potiphar. The favor's on him. God blesses, I'm done. He blesses Potiphar's house because Joseph's there. So now he probably feels like favor got me out of the pit and this is what God has for me. And God's like, this ain't even it. I'm speaking to somebody. You think you're in Pharaoh's house, you're in Potiphar's house. It's another level coming. He becomes captain of the guard. He becomes a, a attendant to captain of the guard, Potiphar. And this is what happens with elevation, which is why everybody is not ready for it. Because elevation gives you options. 
and it attracts all sorts of things that you've got to be willing to turn away from. Because when that man got elevated, now all of a sudden, part of his wife is attracted to him. Because your elevation attracts all sorts of things. And everything it attracts isn't good for you. So the anchor of your integrity has to be deep enough. To see everything that elevation attracts and said, no, 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 no. He says, I cannot watch. He says first, how can I commit this great sin against God? And then my master. He said, I'm not going to do God like that. And I'm not going to do this man like that. And the text says, she gets so assertive and so aggressive that one day she grabs him. She grabs his coat. He comes out of the coat. Y'all missed it. She grabbed the coat. She grabbed the coat. I don't have time to bother this, but, but uh, remember his brothers took the coat. And if she grabbed this coat, it means God gave him another one. Because favor gets you another one. I don't care what you lost. Favor will get you another one. Favor will go fetch another one. You may think another one's not even out there. Favor said, I know where another one is. And I'm going to go get another one and bring it to you. The wife goes to Potiphar and said, this man tried to force himself on me. And I used to think Potiphar believed her. Now I don't think he believed her. I think he appeased her. Because if he believed her, he would have killed him. But he just put him in prison with a butler and a baker. I want to show you how favor works. He's in prison with a butler and a baker. And they start having dreams. And Joseph starts interpreting their dreams. Now, when we first introduced to Joseph, he dreaming dreams. Now he interpreting dreams. And he's interpreting the dreams of people that can't help him. Because most people only want to do stuff for people they think can help them. But this is where favor works. Favor will manifest in God putting you in the proximity of certain people. Not for where they already are, but for where they're getting ready to go. Now, I believe the Holy Ghost is about to set some of you free. The Holy Spirit is about to set some of you free. Because some people's greatest mistake is they left you too soon. Oh, it set me free. It set me free. It said, oh, it said, yo, yo, you left too soon, didn't you? <laughs> you left too soon. He's in prison, not for where they are before they're going, because one of them is going to get out of prison. He's going to serve Pharaoh. Pharaoh, who's the king, is going to start having dreams. Then he's going to remember there was a man in prison that interpreted my dream and they call on Joseph and Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams he says Pharaoh this is what you're dreaming they're going to be seven years where there's plenty of food and harvest and then there's going to be seven years of famine so this is what you need to do I want you to see kingdom work he's not a preacher he's not a preacher he's a businessman about to do kingdom work because he knows how to use his spiritual gift outside the church. Outside the church. <laughs> so all that prophetic insight, he used it outside the four walls of the church. He said, this is what's happening. Seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. 
Now, watch the use of the spiritual gift of wisdom. During the seven years of plenty, when everybody else is spending, we're going to save. So that in the seven years of famine, when they need food, they got to come to us. And what we're going to do is we're going to sell them the food. So we're going to prosper during the famine. And when they run out of cattle and currency, we're going to make them sell us their land. So our empire will expand during the famine. That's the spiritual gift of wisdom. So you see discernment and you see wisdom at work outside the four walls of the church. So the Bible says that famine hits the land and it just happens to hit the land his family's in. And they have to come to Egypt for food. And Joseph is making his rounds and it just so happens coincidentally. He's at the food distribution center. When some people walk up, he look at, say, wait a minute. That looks like my brothers. So he's standing there. He recognizes them. They don't recognize him because they look the same. He looked different because favor will glow you up a little bit. So the Bible says they don't recognize him. So he's talking through an interpreter because now he can speak Egyptian. He said, I'm not, I'm not going back to that language. You got to come up. I'm not talking like that no more. Come up. I'm done. And the Bible says, listen to this family. It says that he reveals himself through a series of events. And once they see it's him, they start making up this story. He's like, nah, I only want to hear it. You're making up this story because you think I'm going to do to you what you would do to me. He says, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. He literally said, God sent me ahead of you. You thought you were putting me in a pit. It was him sending me ahead of you so that I could be here to save your life. He said, I realize I'm not here for me. This is not for me. And the favor that was on Joseph's life was not for him. Here's my one point. God didn't say your favor was for you. The, whatever platform you're on, it's not for you. You get to stand on it because he trusts you with it. And I don't care. Did you hear what I just said? It's not for you. But the favor that's on you will get you through every pit, every prison. It'll get you through Potiphar's house. And it'll get you to Pharaoh's. If you realize and recognize, it's not for me. I want to be such an asset for the kingdom. Y'all, y'all nice. I, I want to be such an ass, I want to be such an asset for the kingdom where God's like, I gotta protect him, not just to protect him, but I gotta protect kingdom interests. What God's getting ready to do in your life, I'm telling you right now. What he's getting ready to do in your life is put you in places. I know what I'm talking about because I know who I'm born for. I'm not born, nothing against anybody else. I'm not born for regular. My anointing not for regular. My anointing is for world changers. And what God is getting ready to, are y'all receiving this? where God is getting ready to put you is about to blow your mind. You think you know because Joseph saw a dream but it was vague. But when he stepped into it he was like, I knew you were going to do something God but I didn't know you were going to do this. I am telling you as sure as my name is Darius Daniels. 
God is about to put some of you in places where you will say, God, I knew you were doing something. I didn't know you were doing this. You are not in Pharaoh's house yet. Everything he's done to this point is just Potiphar's house. This is just a pit stop where he's getting ready to take you. It's where your eyes hadn't seen and your ears hadn't heard, but it's not for you. It's for you to use what he's given you to do for others what Joseph did for his brothers. I'm going to do good with this. In Jesus' name. We're going to prepare to go.